Well, there's the 1918 Spanish flu and the story behind a global health disaster with a local perspective. Um, I think one of the things that comes out of it is actually it's actually quite difficult to get information, and we can discuss why that was the case um, later on. But we've, we've, we've tried our best. We've, um, what I was going to do is look at it from the global point of view first and then try and tie it in with a few uh, bits of information from, uh, from the local area. So it's interesting that this, this topic probably four or five years ago would have been a bit of a dry topic and not something we could actually really identify with. But um, this photograph here is of a policeman in, uh, in Manhattan wearing a, a, a mask. And it's a, a, a site which is now familiar to us, but uh, wouldn't have been you know, four or five years ago. The, uh, the Spanish flu was the first thing to say it was that it wasn't the Spanish flu. Uh, it actually started in, uh, in Kansas. The reason it was called the Spanish flu was because of the uh, the First World War and, and the, the need not to uh, publicize too much bad information. It was very much uh, subdued, the information related to the 1918 uh, outbreak. Spain was an independent country. Uh, and because of this, uh, they were the ones that actually were reporting more on, on what was happening. So hence the label uh, Spanish flu. But we'll go back a bit more to the origins of it um, uh, a bit later on. Um, it was probably one of the most significant, well, it is the most, most significant flu epi epidemic. And it um, occurred in, in three or possibly four waves, depending on where you uh, where you look. Uh, the first wave was uh, in the sp spring, summer of 1918. It actually wasn't particularly uh, bad. Uh, and that may have lulled people into a false sense of security. It was the second wave in the winter of that uh, 1918 that, that really hit home and that's something we can ad identify with um in, 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 with covid i suppose the important thing to say is that fl flu virus and covid are both viruses but they they are they are different so there are some similarities in the sort of general health public health issues but they are different uh, different viruses so in terms of oops I'll get my next slide up now. Oh, sorry. Just to put it in perspective, there's a, a list of the various flu epidemics over the years, uh, starting with the Russian flu in, in 1889 to 1890. And the thing that strikes you is the, the numbers that were involved in the Spanish flu. So the, the, the range of deaths from Spanish flu, if you look from that chart, ranged, in, in terms of estimates, ranged anything from 17 million to 100 million uh, people died with it. Most people seem to go for a figure of about 50 million, which um, is greater than the, than the number of people that were killed in the in the First World War. Um, if you look down at the other flus that we've had, the Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, swine flu, uh, the figures are much, much smaller um, in the sort of region of you know two to three million deaths. Uh, to put it into perspective, COVID was, there were six million deaths with, with COVID. So... Um, so even comparing it to COVID, it is a it is a it was a massive public health um, issue. And if you look at the very bottom, sorry, if you look at the very bottom of the screen there, there's a it says typical flu season. So a typical flu season would be up to half a million deaths. So you get some indication of of the uh, you know, the, the severity of the the epidemic. In terms of um, the actual you know, mortality from it. it the mortality rate was anything from about two and a half percent to five percent, uh, which compares with COVID again with a mortality rate of just under about a percent. Um, and in terms of actual the the, the reckon of, of, of approximately one percent of the world's population, or even up to two percent of the world's population, were actually killed by um, the, the, the the Spanish flu. The other, the other thing, the characteristic was that it, how widespread it was. Um, it actually spread right out to the um, Samoa Islands and, and right out into into that area of the, of the world. Um, and not unsurprisingly, the mortality rate in those areas was probably the highest, possibly because they'd not actually encountered flu virus uh, previously. But that was probably an indication of increasing travel um, at, 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 at the time. So the, the research now suggests it's, 
the strain actually probably first appeared in 1915, but the earliest recorded outbreak was in Kansas in uh, 1918. Um, you have to remember at that stage, we didn't really know much about viruses. And a, a virus had never actually been properly identified at, um, at that stage. Uh, although there was a suspicion there was some some infective material other than bacteria that was causing a problem. Um, the actual, it was actually identified uh, in 1997 as being uh, influenza A, which is a you know, one of the common groups of, of viruses that cause flu. And in 2004, it was identified to being avian flu, so bird flu, basically, which, and they're able to demonstrate how that had been able to be changed to be able to be transmitted to humans. The characteristics of uh, Spanish flu, which were particularly important, was it was highly contagious, had a relatively high mortality rate, uh, and perhaps the most striking thing was that it, it tended to affect the younger populations uh, much more than the older populations. Uh, traditionally, with flu viruses, they, they usually more affect more the elderly population, uh, but this particular virus, for some reason, seemed to attack uh, younger people or, or affect younger people more. And this is an interesting slide of life expectancy. So what it tells you is, for example, if you were born in uh, for various countries, and if you're born in 1751, for example, your life expecting expectancy probably would have been uh, 40. But as health improved, life expectancy improved. But if you notice in this area here, and, oops, sorry. In this area here, and I'm not sure if my is my mouse showing that. Yes. Yeah. If you look at that area there, which co corresponds with the, the uh, Spanish flu, life expectancy dipped dramatically. Just an indication again that it was affecting the younger the younger population. So, uh, in theory, if you're born at that time, your life expectancy, for example, in Finland, would have gone down to just thirty. Um, that effect, some of that effect may have also been the the you know the first uh, the first world war, but uh, you can see there's a, a, a distinct effect on uh, the health of the of the world, and it's it's also reckoned to be the first time that uh, that the population of the world actually decreased over a few years. And why did it happen? Well, there was basically a perfect storm. You've got to remember that we're getting to 1918, towards the end of the the first world war. A population which is already under, under great uh, economic and uh, social pressures uh, with generally poor health. You know, we've only just had the introduction of national insurance in 1911 by Lloyd George. There was a fairly rudimentary welfare and, and uh, system, um, and healthcare was obviously not at the level that, even though we say it's poor at the moment, it's not. The, it was. There was. It certainly wasn't at any great decent level at that stage. A lot of industrial towns with a um, lot of crowded population. And obviously the, the First World War itself, when you got a lot of young people, um, young men crammed together in um, in trenches, etc., uh, or in, in transport across across the channel to, the, uh, uh, to Europe, then obviously these are perfect conditions for the virus. Generally poor sanitation. The also, the other thing is that you were, the war itself was was already stretching uh, medical resources um, and, and medical personnel were not, just not there and available in the in the um, within uh, Britain. Also, a limited understanding about the flu virus, as we said already, and perhaps one of the most crucial things was that there was no antibiotics, and a lot of the deaths from uh, Spanish flu were related to what we call secondary infections. So a person becomes infected with the virus, their immune system is weakened, uh, they develop things like pneumonia, um, and, and obviously succumb to that. Uh, obviously, we had no vaccines. No, I know there's contentious views on vaccines, but there is no doubt that vaccines do will reduce mortality or the use of what we now call antivirals. Um, at that stage in 1918, uh, they didn't really understand the full thing, anything about viruses, to, so they obviously didn't have antivirals. And the other thing is lack of information, and there's two ways of looking at this. Either there was lack of, lack of 
information deliberately um, because they didn't want to, there's a general suppression in the media. But also uh, it's a different time in terms of, of communications between different countries. And it may well be that uh, some countries weren't totally aware of what was happening in other countries and hadn't really put two and two together and realised this was in fact a, a national or an international um, a pandemic. At the time, it was quite interesting that I've, I've looked back at some of the what's called the British Medical Journal, and interesting to see what people were thinking of at, at, um, at the time. And there, a lot of medicine is based on observation, and then from those observations, trying to work out what's actually happening. Um, and in the British British Medical Journal, um, there, there was certain uh, things stated, which one of the things was about the fact that they realised that in in some areas there was high mortality, in other areas there was different mortality, and they did actually speculate that there was slightly different versions of the virus. Uh, so that they were they were already onto the fact that um, there were possible mutations. Uh, they also realised that there was a that it was the second infections which were really the problem, um, and that they noticed. They could identify lots of bacteria in these patients that were dying um, and realised that these was actually causing the death. Where, um, but the, the virus had put them in a situation which made them succumb to these infections. The other thing was that there was a consistent description of the slightly unusual colour of the severely ill patients, which often described as a, a kind of violet, bluish colour. Um, and there's a feeling that this was probably related to some toxin that was released by the, um, by the bacteria. It's also interesting that even in uh, 1918, there were some diff conflicting views on the benefits of lockdowns and uh, school closures. So in one contemporary article in um, from 1920, um, it says, epidemic inquiries appear to show in some localities that, that one attack can, can confer immunity, as, as we have already discussed. But also that it became clear at an early date that attempts to control an epidemic by school closures and regulation of places of public entertainment were useless. So that was obviously an argument against uh, against lockdown. But we'll come later on to that because of the other people felt differently. Obviously, they were tr str struggling to know what what treatments to give, and there was various variety of treatments, which um, anything from from laxatives to uh, Quinines, to which ring, rings a bell now with um, the, the chloroquine that was mentioned during the, the COVID pandemic, but a whole variety of uh, basically trying anything to, um, uh, to help the, uh, the situation. As always in these situations, it's always the interesting ones to me are always the, uh, the personal stories. And one thing that comes across is a lot of these personal stories are based on observations by the army, uh, where ob because of the because of so many young people and young being affected by the um, the virus, a lot of it was concentrated in the army. And there was one story from um, I, I don't know if anybody knows a consultant in Bolton called uh, Dr. Moriarty, uh, but he wrote in the British Medical Journal um, a few years ago with his story of his. Um, his uncle, which was Patrick Collins, who was fighting in the army. Um, I'll just read what he says. When the influenza pandemic struck, it went through his camp like wildfire. Uh, Patrick noticed that virtually all those who had stayed in camp died, presumably from secondary infections. When he developed the first signs of influenza, he begged that he allowed to be allowed to leave camp with three days rum ration and a tent. He managed to drag himself and his tent up the hill away from the camp, and there he sweated and shivered and was delirious for several days, sustained by his rum allowance. Patrick was one of the few survivors. So he'd recognised the importance of actually keeping away from other people, and in doing so probably saved his life, whereas most of his colleagues uh, actually died. There was also a letter um, from a doctor from uh, Mozambique writing to a colleague whose son had died with it. And it's actually quite quite tragic listening to the uh, his description. Um, he 
just going through what he what he said. Uh, sorry, he, he talked about the, the the how difficult it was a medical officer and, and dealing with all these um, all these deaths. Um, so he starts. You know, he did fairly well for the first. This is describing the son's illness. He did fairly well with the first three days and was quite cheerful about himself. Uh, but his temperature remained up high, and he suffered from a gastritis um, and had a good deal of vomiting. About the fifth day or so, his right lung became affected, and, and later the left. And he was obviously very ill, but in no pain. He gradually felt worse, and I think about the eighth day, he was quite unconscious. For the day or two before, he was obviously suffering from severe poisoning and was drowsy and difficult to move. During the night of the, think the, the ninth day of his illness, he died. As a matter of fact, I was lying ill myself in the tent next to him and could hear in the stillness of the night his rather heavy breathing, and I heard it stop suddenly. And that's a fairly typical story of, of, of how, what, how quick an onset the, the, uh, the condition was. But it also, also shows that, the, obviously, the doctors looking after them, the, the soldiers were, weren't immune to the problem themselves, and, and they often, often uh, you know, succumbed to it. The final thing was a letter from a, a, a doctor in Detroit. And then he gives us, again, he does, gives a description of what was ha happening at the time. These men start with what appears to be an ordinary attack of la grippe or influenza. And when to bring, brought to the hospital, they very, very, very rapidly developed the most vicious type of pneumonia that has ever been seen. Two, uh, two hours after admission, they have mahogany spots over their cheekbones. And a few hours later, you can begin to see the cyanosis extending from their ears and spreading all over their face until it is hard to distinguish the coloured man from the white. It is only a matter of a few hours until death comes, and it is simply a struggle for air until they suffocate. It is horrible. One can stand to see it in one or two uh, men, or 20 men, but to see these poor devils dropping out like flies uh, gets on your nerves. We have been averaging about 100 deaths per day, and still keeping it up. There's no doubt in my mind that there is a new mixed infection here, but what, I don't know. And I think it's a fairly graphic description of the feeling of helplessness as all these young um, young soldiers are, are dying in front of them. Um, I think the just as a pertinent point, my my daughter worked through the pandemic at um, Withenshaw Hospital, uh, and I think she could write the same Sorry, same description. I think it is something that's probably not recognised how stressful it was for the uh, the doctors and nurses dealing with that situation, and it probably was as bad now in the first wave of the um, of, of the, the pandemic um, as it was in uh, in nineteen eighteen. That that feeling that. Um, you were dealing with something which you just couldn't control. And uh, no matter what, what you tried, uh, people were dying in front of you. Now to try and get it back to a more sort of local um, local level. Uh, there's an intriguing story about Lloyd George and Manchester and the flu. So uh, Lloyd George came to, um, to Manchester in uh, 1918 uh, set, or September uh, 1918, um, to receive the uh, the freedom of the city of Manchester. Um, Lloyd George being born in uh, Shorten and Medlock, and almost to mirror what happened to Boris Johnson, he actually caught caught uh, influenza in Manchester uh, to the point where he had to get admitted to a, a temporary sick bed in the uh, town hall in Manchester, uh, where he. Uh, was there for 11 days with a rudimentary uh, ventilator to help him with his uh, breathing and it was obviously quite uh, touch and go uh, when he was in uh, in Manchester. Sorry. Sorry, there's one missing here. For some reason, a missing a slide there, but there were, the next slide was going to be uh, just to show how 
now head of the game, Manchester were the, the, during the pandemic. It was a, a Scottish um, medical officer for health in Manchester called James Niven, Dr. James Niven. Um, and he was meticulous in recording deaths and, and he noticed in the very first wave where everybody else was assuming it was a, a fairly mild wave. Uh, he noticed that young children were the, the number of deaths of young children was, was particularly high, and he realised that something needed to be done, um, and probably took the first wave more seriously than everybody else. The, the advice, central government advice at that stage, was that this was nothing unusual and just to carry on as normal. Um, and he had to take this in the context of um, you know war and and the priority of keeping munitions factories open, etc. So he started. Um, Things like school closures and and um, essentially recommending uh, social distancing. Um, he also produced thirty five thousand uh, leaflets, uh, which he uh, was distributed around the around the Manchester area and, and the local areas like Wigan, um, advising people on what to do. So it was the first sort of public health information uh, campaign, and he also had, he was aware of the uh, the effect on. Um, on on people in terms of their, their ability to get to get a, to get food, etc. And he provided um, a lot of free food, particularly um, baby milk. Um, and to this, to a certain extent, then Manchester was actually and the, and the surrounding areas are slightly better protected. Um, but then in the in the spring of um, so it, the result was that in spring 1918. Uh, there was only 322 uh, deaths uh, in Manchester, which is significantly lower than in other parts of the uh, of the country. Um, I mean, his his um, policy was almost confirmed as being right straight after the um, celebration of the armistice in November 18, uh, where he was unable to prevent the, the, the mass gatherings, uh, and that actually resulted in this big spike in deaths in, in Manchester and the surrounding areas following um, uh, following the Armistice Day. Rather tragically, uh, post-retirement, he uh, suffered from quite significant depression, apparently, and uh, sadly committed suicide in, uh, in 1925. But I, I think a kind of uh, unsung hero, I think, really, in, um, in doing his, his bit for Manchester. So trying to get it a bit more local now, we just um, as Rachel and myself found, it was quite difficult to get a lot of detail of information. But there are little snippets, um, and partly from the the article by the fast forward article uh, by um, Yvonne Eckersley. And you'll notice here there's a concentration again of young people, um, and one of the tragedies was that the, because the, the the first wave did start in the summertime. Although to a certain extent it may have meant there was less spread because there were you know, pupils were no longer in school at that particular point, it did mean that people actually died on, on holiday and could have, could die quite quickly. So there's a, there's talk of a 29 year old widow dying with flu on holiday in Blackpool, and that's another interesting point that in in the Wigan area most of the deaths actually were in women, but um, about two thirds of the deaths were in um, in women. Um, and presumably this was because uh, a lot of the men folk were actually, or that age group were actually, you know, fighting the the war. But obviously that meant either the the, the children were left without um, both parents because both had died, one in the war and one by the flu, or they were left on their own because the, their uh, their father was um, uh, fighting the First World War. So again, it had significant social in, in, impact. Um, again, that's a, a man contact, contacting flu in Blackpool and dying a couple of weeks later. And again, another 37-year-old mother of five and a war widow dying with the flu. And again, talks of just some kind of idea of the severity of the uh, condition that in um, there were 22 burials in the space of four days in, in Lee Cemetery in, uh, in February 19. So, you know, we can reflect on what, you, what we suffered in COVID and then think of that Um uh, yeah, multiplied as always in these uh, kind of situations um, 
there's always people willing to try and make money out of trying to produce some kind of revenue. And then the, uh, Rachel found this advert for Dr. Strong's tonic blood wine, uh, which was a, a tonic that was suggested at the time to, um, you know, to control the, the symptoms or, or, or cure people from, uh, from the Spanish flu. So that's that gives you some some idea of the of the of the, the nature of the flu and uh, some impact on Wigan. And, and I think if, certainly I think if Rachel and I had a bit had more time, um, I think we would we'll try and try and get a bit more information about how it affected Wigan. But the thing, the striking thing for me is that this is a, a period of you know you're coming to the end of the war, having gone through a pandemic, you then end up with a you know, severe depression. Um, that must have been for that those two decades must have been a real battering, um, but we but the yeah, the country came out of it. Um, the, the other thing is just as a sort of I don't want to be in like a doomsday kind of scenario, but this is a flu pandemic. Which part of the reason why it was so severe was they hadn't got antibiotics. We're getting to the stage where we're getting increasing resistance to antibiotics. There will be another flu epidemic, um, and unless we use antibiotics carefully, um, we may be in a situation where we face another flu epidemic without antibiotics. And I think it's a sobering thought um, about the care that's needed sometimes in, in how we look after the treatments that are are, uh, are given to us. So there you are. That's my little run through. So if any questions or anything people want to talk about? Um, I'll unmute everybody now, Richard. Uh, do you want to stop sharing your screen and then we've got the yep. gallery? Um, Thank you. If you just, it's at the yep. top. Yeah, got it, yeah. Claire, yeah. Can, sorry, can I just jump in quickly just with a couple of bits that I've found as well to add on? Oh, do you want to share Please. the screen? Yeah, no, they're just in my notes anyway, and they, they won't take long. Um, but one of the one of well, a few of the things that I found were really interesting. One of them um, is about the coal. Within a week of the outbreak, apparently Wigan coal fields were reporting a third of the workforce were absent, which is a huge number when you think and how important the, the coal mines were at the time. So that was one statistic that I was surprised at. Um, Anybody that's interested in this subject, as me and Richard have said, it's really hard to find very much in um, contemporary newspapers. If you are looking, they seem to be buried in the bottom right hand page. OK, when you if you're trying to find there's no big headlines about it in any of the newspapers um, and the quite the, the well like out of a lot that we read there, there was one that was basically um a headline this was dated on the 23rd of july 1918 um and this was bit this was headlined the influenza epidemic on page three the bottom right um i'll just read it out anyway so as a preventive measure against the spread of the influenza epidemic, the Wigan Corporation Libraries Committee, acting on the advice of Dr. Wynne, the medical officer for the borough, have decided that the issue of books in the lending departments shall be suspended until further review. And that was just a really short little bit. And it's really interesting to think that, you know, obviously people were dying. But that didn't. That wasn't kind of featured in the newspaper. It was literally that you couldn't get books out the library. That was what they were. One of one of the ways they were doing it. Um, one of the other things I, I, that I found, and if we have more time, you know, to to actually get in the archives because we're limited really with what's actually just readily available, is that there were apparently increased suicides around this the time, and. A few that I read that it for some people it caused a kind of mania. So some of the cases were actually um, kind of murder, suicides. So basically one of the cases, this wasn't a Wigan one, this is a national one, where basically the dad, they all had flu, but the dad then killed the wife and the children. So there was like really awful, really awful stories, really awful things happening. Um now, there was one article, I think, on, um, let me just 
grab that on um school closures. So basically in uh 2nd of July 1918, um, Hindley, a school called Castle Hill School. Uh, now, again, this is buried at the bottom of the page. This is the 2nd of July 1918. The medical officer advised that school be closed for seven days. A um, hundred children were absent from Castle Hill School and 30 were absent from the infant school. Um, so obviously there were um, school closures and school absences, but... Obviously, as, as Richard said, without the kind of mass, you know, communication that we have now, it's all just it was all just a completely different mm. thing. And obviously, with the whole um, the fact that they were still at war when it started, you showed him then. They were also it was also um, you know the whole thing about keeping up morale basically was obviously a huge um, factor in that, right? So, any questions for Richard? <laughs> one, one thing I forgot to say actually, and the one of the speculations why it affected the young population was actually because the the Russian flu in the eighteen nineties had had given some immunity to the older population. So, mm. so, so that 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 may well be why the uh, the, uh, the elder population did slightly better because they'd actually been exposed to this to the uh, the Russian flu. Mm. Um, the other thing is again talking about. After effects of the flu, that there was um, one of the things it did tend to do was a thing called en encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain, and that would that would sometimes lead to uh, you know delirium and, and odd behaviour. But also there was a for some time there's always been a speculation there was a condition called encephalitis lethargica, which seemed to appear around about the same time, um, and that was almost like a Parkinson's type of illness, which a lot of the sufferers had. So that was the sort of, you know, the long COVID of its day. Now there's still some speculation whether that was just a separate, just a coincidence. And there was actually a separate virus going around which caused that. But temporarily there seems to be a connection between uh, the Spanish flu and then this, this condition called encephalitis lethargica where people would literally be just look very, um, very blank faces and, and um, you know, very, very tired, continually tired. Thank, thank you so much, both of you. Um, I'm not going to say it was enjoyable, but it was totally fascinating. <laughs> uh, it really was. Um, thank you. Look, we've got about ten. Question, please. Yeah, yeah, about ten minutes. Let's let's go for some questions. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got. Uh, what I've actually got two. Could All probably right. have five. Um, oh no! Do you, you, you think uh, uh, um, <clears throat> COVID could have matched the numbers of uh, Spanish flu? Had we not had. Uh, the, uh, the the health knowledge that we have now. I know it's speculative, but it, it, yeah, it's, it is speculative. Um, it's it's very difficult to know. It, um, I I I know there's issues over vaccines, and people have very strong opinions about it. But certainly from a medical point of view, I I think um, it it did have an effect on 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 mortality. Definitely, uh, whether it had an effect on transmission, I, you know, that's probably maybe not quite as strong as that but i think uh, i think it would have helped with severity and certainly there's undoubtedly antibiotics would have uh it was a big a uh, big factor and then just mm -hmm. yeah general our general health um even though we think we're not that that good it's probably you know less, better than it would have been in 1911 i think the other big thing is is information i think um that's, that's much more global information about what was happening and um uh which um, I think does help in terms of um, you know, having early warning signs and things. Obviously, there's still a lot to learn from COVID, and as as the inquiry is, is doing at the moment, and hopefully it doesn't get sort of too bogged down in kind of tittle tattle, but actually properly looking at what's what's um, you know what went on and what could have been done differently without getting too personal. And um, 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 but yeah, we it's funny we 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 learn and we don't learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You would have thought we well, might have got a better idea about whether lockdowns and masks and things did work. And it was interesting that the, you know they were wearing masks in 1919. Now we, at the beginning, we were told they weren't necessary. Then we were told they were necessary. You know, you'd have thought by now we've got some kind of no, idea no. what's the best way forward. But um, mm -hmm. hey ho, Paul, we're all human. Yeah, thanks for that. Do you have another question, Paul? Yeah, one? yeah, yeah. Very, very quickly. Yeah, we we, we learn, but we don't learn. Uh, so many viruses seem to come through uh, 
like typically bird viruses uh, from people working with large flocks of, of, of birds. I mean, we keep getting told they're all coming from China. Um, but uh, do, do, do you not think we should learn something? Uh, and I'm not going to beat the drum of vegetarianism because I'm a, a confirmed meat eater. Uh, but our, our farming methods uh, could be improved so that transmissions uh, to humans could be avoided. But after saying that, uh, there's signs that this current bird flu epidemic has been showing up in mammals in South Georgia, elephant seals. Uh, mm. So, okay, that yeah, they're, they're also being worried. Richard? It, it, it's, it, we talk about influenza A, influenza B. There's actually four four main groups. There's influenza A, B, C, and D. So A is very much from birds and, and pigs, uh, but also in humans. But um, And B and C are, are, are primarily human, but, but D does come from cattle and, 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 and pigs. So that, yeah, there is a strong link to um, mm. transmission from animals to, to humans. What the... I mean, viruses are, are, are funny things, really. They, they, what happens? It happens by mistake, in a sense that the these oh. the, the viruses get into your into into the animal, and then there's something which happens almost by mistake, which then allows them to then get across to to humans. When then in humans, because they're dividing and replicating so quickly, mistakes are made. But these are, these mistakes lead to a benefit for the virus. Uh, so this is when we get mutations. Mutations are just ha uh, random things that happen, mm. and it's a survival of the fittest. If, if a virus mutates in a way which makes it more contagious, then that will then that that, that will be the one that then predominates. And the interesting thing about a virus is that from a virus's survival, the worst kind of survival, a uh, worst kind of virus is a very very um, high mortality virus because if it's very high mortality. Um, a person dies before they get a chance to pass it on. Mm. Yes. Um, the most mm. the common cold is a classic example of a virus which has survived because it, it spreads fairly easily. It doesn't kill the person. They can keep on spreading it. Then it can go on to the next person, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole thing about viruses and how they work is – and we're getting more understanding of that, obviously, um, mm. over the years. Um, the, Any, yeah. Sorry, go on. Thank, thank, thanks for that. That's a Again, fascinating. Any quick questions about what's been said? Yeah. Yes, I have one. Sorry. Yeah, Derek. Very yeah. Good. yeah, it was interesting that there seems to be a uh, lack of coverage in the Wigan yeah. area, news, newspapers, yeah. etc. How, how was it treated nationally in national newspapers and radio? I, I suspect much the same. And, and, and just from a medical point of view, the, the British Medical Journal is, is produced weekly. Um, and I was surprised how little it actually was in the British Medical Journal at the time. So I think this is a, it's not, it was a, I think it's a, a global uh, picture. And, and the stuff that came in the British Medical Journal was, was very much from army based doctors. Um, if you compare that to COVID um, and the British Medical Journal during COVID, I mean, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't turn a page without something on COVID. Um, so again, mm. it, it's difficult to know whether it is a, they were just too busy doing other things. Um, you know, you're fighting a, a, a war, you're dealing with young men dying from wounds and injuries, and um, your resources are going towards um, the First World War. Perhaps you haven't got time to actually sit back and discuss this this flu thing that's going around as well. It's You get the feeling it was almost like um, overwhelming. It's just another thing we're having to deal with here. It's, um, you know, we've got the world war, we've got this flu. We, you know, it's, it's almost in that kind of vein. Mm. It wasn't as much news as you think it might be because of everything else which was going on at the time. Mm. Uh, people yeah. were, the tragedies of the First World War were such that that was enough to, um, if you like, fill their tragedy mm. bucket. Um, too much, yeah. Too much, really, yeah. yeah. When, when was the magnitude of the problem recognised then? Mm. It was really the second wave. It seems to be the, the, the first wave was... Um, as I say, it was almost for anybody that's used to Irish history, then um, if, if we talk about the famine in Ireland, um, the first potato um, failure wasn't seen as particularly unusual because that's that's that did happen from time to time. It was the second one when it when you get it again and you realize this is really actually a bit more than you thought. So I think in hindsight, if you look at it, it was probably slightly unusual to get a flu flu outbreak in um in the sort of spring and summertime 
Um, so that probably would have been a bit of a warning, really. But and the fact that it occurred in summer meant that obviously, as I say, the schools broke up and and you know, there probably wasn't as much spread. So I think it was probably the second way when people realised actually this is um, this is a bit more than we um, you know we thought. Yeah. Mm. I've just so, put my screen up then. I don't know if you, can everybody see that. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Just got the dates on. Um, so when I was actually when I was doing the masters, I started looking at this, but then went down a different route. Um, so I was just basically looking at kind of the treatments, you know, kind of this idea about how you know companies have tried to commercialize. Um, treatments. So on that, though, the, the, it's got details about when they were, and like, as Richard mm. said, kind of the first wave was associated with low mortality, then the second wave, which obviously then coincided really with the end of the war, um, mm. and then another one, but that that one went. So this article, the first one, this um, Lauren Alex O'Hagan, um, so she was looking at basically these companies that were taking advantage really of um public anxieties really about it and what people could do. Um, and, and like we said, really, it's a national thing that it's not just, you know, the Wigan and Lee papers, it's very much um, the, nas the national picture is um, that it was not really, you know, not, not really headline news kind of thing. So um, I do think as well, the whole thing of, Obviously, there was so there was so much illness as well. You know, I think that's what we've got to remember. Then, you know, the cholera epidemics from you know Victorian times, where there was like fifty, I think it was fifty percent mortality rate for some of those. You know, in the slums. So even though obviously this was a really high mortality rate, I think some of the older generations were probably used to. Not that everybody and it gets used to it, but it wasn't a new thing for them. You know, I think for us, it's felt COVID felt like a new thing, really. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, thanks. That's again fascinating. Interesting. Can we go back to the full screen? Yeah. See us all again. Yeah. It's Twenty. Could I just any? Could yeah, I go just on. I just wanted to mention that um, about about ten years ago, um, I think I'm right in saying there was a BBC Four documentary um called something like the spanish flu the forgotten fallen mm -hmm. and um it um it featured the work of dr james niven all right uh, right it's a it's a name that i remember because i'm actually from manchester so i'd i'd heard of this bloke before um mm. and uh, i just um had a very very quick look and it is actually available on youtube so it might be yeah. worth checking out. I don't know if anybody already much. already has yeah. done that, but um... if if I um that's really interesting actually because I, I I find him quite a fascinating character. I'd love to find out more about him actually. Mm. But I've, if I share my screen again, I've, I've, but I, for some reason they, it didn't show on there. This this is the guy. Um, um, I remember that being on BBC Four. Yeah. Because when mm. you that's, talked about there Nick, he is, that yeah. Bell, that's a gentleman. Yeah. Um, Great man. He looks a. Uh, he's got very kind eyes, as they say. Yeah, he, he looks. Yeah. yeah, he looks a thoughtful guy, doesn't he? And he's. Um, yeah. yeah. Sad end. Came to a sad end. How sad. Yeah, Tragic. yeah. But mm. um, so that that was on channel channel four. Do you say, Gwen? No, it was on it was on BBC YouTube. Four. Okay. But right. it, is actually, it is actually on YouTube. The whole documentary is on YouTube. I've just if checked. You can... If you can find it precisely, Gwyn, it'd be great to have it and we can get it round. It'd be good. Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing it when it was on the TV originally. Yeah. No. Did they close but, the schools in Wigan? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. All yeah. of them. I don't know if I, it's hard. To, we can't find out really how, oh. you know, mm. how <laughs> it's going to. You're trying to find really a bit of a needle in the haystack because, like I said, a lot oh. of this information was buried anyway, so it's not in the press. Mm. But they were advised, the chief medical officer said that they should be closed. Yeah. Like I said, I know for definite, just from what was in that newspaper, in the Wigan uh, newspaper, that they were. Um, but it's hard to kind of you know, give a definitive definitive answer really on some of it until, I know when I was looking, I think in um, the Wigan Council records, there is stuff there, but it's kind of a book about like mm. yeah. <laughs> eight inches Thanks. thick. <laughs> Thanks very much. So we've got about a minute left. 
Any quick questions before we move on to this second small issue? Or are we? Are we? <laughs> can I just, Richard? It's not surprising, is it, that I never heard of it when I was growing up uh, yeah. in the forties yeah. and fifties. My no. parents had obviously somehow experienced it, had they? My grandparents must have, but I never once remember it being mentioned. Maybe it wouldn't have done to a young boy like me. Is that not surprising? Just it's it's life. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's funny, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think as I said before, I think it was just a, probably another thing on top of everything else. And, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. But they're an incredibly resilient uh, oh, generation. Yeah. That's all you can say. I mean, it's just. Yeah, you take your hat off them, you know, what they yeah, had to put up with. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And this was one more thing. Look, I think as, gonna... a, as a as a yeah. parent in that era, knowing that either your, your child was either going to die from the war or die from the Spanish yeah. flu, it's just, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there was a programme on the other day about, um, was it Arthur Conan Doyle about his son? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Did anybody see that? Yeah. yeah. Lucy, Lucy Worsley. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. good, yeah. She's done some brilliant ones, hasn't she? Oh, yeah, it was a great yeah, programme, wasn't really it? really interesting, yeah. that one. Yeah. I think Ella, let's not let's sorry, let's not go let's not sorry, go John. diverted into into Sherlock Holmes. But yeah, uh... sorry, John. The one thing I just want to say as well is that it was when I've been reading about it and from you know the kind of society point of view is that it wasn't even just the the people that died from it, the young people, you know, the young adults. Mm. The fact that they never had children, so there's a whole no, generation yeah. of children well, that weren't yeah. born. You know, that that was like quite a large. I yeah. can't remember what the number was, but it was kind of a few thousand. Yeah, that weren't born because of it. Yeah, yeah. Mm, thank yeah. you so much. Look, I'm, I'm sadly I'm going to stop it there, with a big, big, big thanks to Richard and Rachel, in introducing us to a subject. Wow, I'm going to find out more as soon as this is over. But thank you so much, both of you. We don't applaud on here, do we? Or <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure well, that we do. Does. You can do. <laughs> Try it. Yeah, that's that's good. Thank you very much.